all the books. Hey, hey, it's time for book reviews. Hello everyone and welcome to Forkmaster's vlog for the Warm of the Vast and Gaming System, created by Games Workshop based in the UK. And welcome to my 135th book review of this vlog. Today I'm reviewing the horror series novel called The Crimson King, written by Graham McNeil, which is a direct sequel to A Thousand Sons and Thief of Revelations, which is both also written by Graham McNeil. We can begin to talk about the front cover for The Crimson King. On it we see the final moments as the Space Wolves are making their way towards Magnus' last stand. I would have been honest to say this cover is lacking. Magnus looks disastrously ugly, not even, not even close to his appearance on A Thousand Sons or the Magnus novella. The Thousand Sons look cartoonish as well. I think the Space Wolves are those with the best details. But then we have this weirdo looking in the wrong direction. Now I'm surprised that they went with this moment and not something from the actual novel, like Magnus Ascension or something like that. I will give this front cover 6 out of 10 forks. Let's see what this novel is all about. The Crimson King. After the raising of Prospero, Magnus the Red spirited the Thousand Sons away from to the planet of sorcerers, deep within the Eye of Terror. Removed from the concerns of the galaxy at large and regarding the War Master's unfolding heresy with cold detachment, he has de dedicated his hollow existence to the preservation of all the knowledge once held in the great libraries of Tiska, should mankind ever seek such enlightenment again. But his sons can see the change in their Primarch. He is a broken soul whose mind and memories are slipping away into the tumult of the warp. Only by returning to the scenes of his greatest triumphs and tragedies can they hope to restore him and allow the Crimson King to be crowned anew by the ruinous powers. So let's place this novel in a chronological order so you know what primary stories you should have read prior to reading all of this. First of all, read A Thousand Sons and A Prospero Burns, which is the, the duology which started the plotline of Magnus Red and A Thousand Sons. To a certain degree, read False Gods as, it, as, as well as it contains a small scene important to all of it. Following that, we see the further into Magnus and Lorger's re relationship and Magnus' state in Aurelian, where he has yet to choose a side. Following that, I would recommend that you read The Outcast Dead, as it furthers the consequences of Magnus' folly. Then after that, read Magnus' novella, as it gives more of when they first arrived on the planet of sorcerers also known as Sortiarius. Since it had connection to the Outcast Dead, I would recommend that you read it afterwards. Then you listen to Thief of Revelations, following mostly that of Araman's storyline as he tries to find a cure to the flesh change. Following that, I would also add that you read the short story called Dust, which is falsely marketed as a 40k story when it's obviously a Horus Heresy story. I would also place that it takes place after the Angels Exterminatus, as what happened in Lucius the Eternal Blade continues in this story. It also takes place after the Ventral Spirit, as they make a reference to the failed infiltration mission and Horus rebirth after his journey into the warp, and that five years has passed since Prospero. It makes a casual reference to Deathfire, as Magnus briefly appeared in that story, and it had to be acknowledged very poorly. And lastly, you should read The Last Son of Prospero, as the Shards of Magnus is first properly mentioned here. But then you also have references and characters from the novels Araman Exile, Araman Sorcerer and Araman Unchanged, all collected into the Araman Omnibus, which you could read to further expand your understanding of, of the Crimson King, but it's nothing I would recommend, as I feel those books are terribly written by John French. So if you look at this image right now, you have a thematical circle of stories going around and round. So we can go over the characters in this novel. Returning as the main character is Chief Librarian Asik Araman. He is joined by Amon, still serving as his faithful equerry, Hafermat and several other important characters. Some of them are from the Araman trilogy and it doesn't really matter as you shouldn't read those books. So they established themselves deep within the Eye of Terror on the planet of sorcerers known as Sortiarius. Araman is desperately trying to save his legion from the flesh change, but their Primarch doesn't really care. What we also find out is that their Primarch is dying. 
He desperately tries to write down everything he remembers, but as he does that, part of him withers away. After collecting an oracle being known as the Iron Oculus from Temel Temeluka, or Temelusha, which we later find out is Kairos the Fate Weaver, or I was spoiled long before I could read the book because Black Library hates it, their customers by selling them hardbacks first and not the softbacks. But that's another story. Ironman tries to find out the true name of it, but that is saved until the very end. Meanwhile, the Iron Oculus, a Forgomon, gives a hint of the future to come, but just as they, they are about to die, Sobek sacrifices himself for the rest where he is cursed with the flesh change. The swordman Lucius is also in this story, as we last saw him on Sortiarius in the short audio drama Lucius the Internal Blade. I wasn't surprised to see him again here, and it felt too much of an obvious setup, but I wouldn't say McNeil do does much with the character, with the exception of a strange character choice. He is supposed to be knee deep in corruption, but towards the end, Hafermath sacrifices his well being in order to heal the swordman and make him look like an identical copy of Fulgrim. It makes no sense as it would ruin his story arc for going from the beautiful individual to the scarred corruption of Slanesh. The character of Arman is weirdly misused as well as his end would be trying to unmake the Thousand Sons in uh, Arman Exile. He would be an antagonist so it would be fine for McNeil to, to build that up here perhaps. But nope, that role fell to Men Menkaura instead. Equally, the former organization of the Thousand Sons seems to have a, a continuity error or a deliberate change from McNeil as he suggests that there are only five fellowships now, one for each of the cults. Not as a bad as the changes he made in Angel Exterminatus and it could be explained, but I still got my eyes on him. But either way, Amon summons 300 of their warriors and sends them back to Prospero. There they fight off the ghost remnants of the space wolves and demons. There's an image of the battle which I found, it illustrates quite intensely what is going on here at least. At least two thirds died, but it gives them more clues to of where to look. Magnus then takes Amon out on a passage where he's hurt and almost killed in the process. Malkador then sends out one of his agents, Dio Promus, the former chief, chief librarian of the Ultramarines and a now a knight errant, whom is joined by the Space Wolves that are ab about to finish the job with the Magnus Red. His part in the story was one of those I cared extra about. He was a minor mention in A, a Thousand Sons, who was developed and expanded upon in this story. Being an agent of the City Light does not come without its problems, as he is forced to kill space marines who weren't deemed fit to join them in order to keep a secret. That secret would eventually be his death. They are either way sent to Kamiti Sona, a psychic prison under the watchful care of the Silent Sisters. I would also say I did enjoy the Space Wolves, but I did hate them for their stubbornness as they show at the end of this story. Another character that, that returns is Lemuel Gauman, who we last saw being apprehended by the Space Wolves. He is imprisoned in Kamiti Sona, where the agents of Malkador seeks him out as they believe something big is about to happen. Right in the middle of their visits, the Thousand Sons burst out causing a huge firefight. Araman is searching after Mahavastu Kalimachus, which is told to ha has a shard of Magnus inside himself. This small piece explained Araman's sorcerer so much and actually lessened my disappointment with that ending in that story as well. The Thousand Sons manages to escape on a titan. Lemuel and Menkaura are left behind and forced to join the agents of Malkador. He is still furious with what Araman did to their friend back on Prospero and wants to seek out revenge. Lemuel is also left with the guilt that he made a woman smother her child in order for them to not be found by demons stalking the prison. They travels towards Agoru, where it all started. Menkaura asks them how it would have been if, they, the, if their entire legion would have stood with the Space Wolves against Horus, and the Space Wolf Bjarki says that it's not for them to know. So Magnus and his condition is what I would compare to that of Dementia, as, as he shows all the signs for it, and I would say it comes across very well. The on only problem is that it perhaps, unlike Fulgrim, whose fate has been shrouded in mystery, 
Magnus fate as a demon primarch is well documented so his death doesn't feel that all that threatening. In the end they collect different shards of Magnus to combine them all and some of these shards are Camille Shivani, the shard of Agurum representing his warrior aspects, the shard of Cadmus where they traveled back in time and a scene which you could read in Prospero Burns is featured again, but instead from the perspective of Caspar Hofser it is from the past and sons that meet him. That connection made me gleeful on a silly level, as the, now it all explains that thing. Cadmus was the same shard that vi visited the, the salamanders in the Deathfire novel. Then lastly, it is the shard of Nikea representing his feeling of betrayal. Not all shards were collected, but as we know some were destroyed or killed, or some were found several thousand years later. They are all transported to a warp version of Tiska, where they fight for a little bit until all the shards of the Magnus are brought back together. Promise is killed by the Space Wolves and Lemuel reveals himself, change his name to Promius, which does come out of nowhere, and if it weren't for the fact that I looked it up, it would have flown past my head that he was one of the four human founders of the Inquisition together with Moriana. She is an individual that will pop up somewhere else in another review later on. But on a second reading I understand that the name was to honor Promos who was killed here. So in this novel there is a small interaction between Magnus and Lorgar which I did enjoy. It further shows their special relation which we saw in A Thousand Sons, The First Heretic and Aurelian. Lorgar still pleads for him to join the Pantheon and Horus to which Magnus is tired of hearing about. I did find it ironic that they see each other as the lesser depending on which point of view we see it from and both are slaves in their own ways. Magnus remains undecided and in his anger he banishes Lorgar. I would imagine that this would put a strain and make a crack in their relation for the future. But after having turned into a demon Primarch, his will is resonate once more and he will decide that he will join Horus' side in the war. He swears that he will save the Imperium and he will reclaim the greatest shard that is trapped within Arvida, now known as Janus. On that note, the novel ends. So, what did I think about this novel? Well, uh, it seems to be well researched, I would say. I think it, it, the way it's told and how Magnus the Red ascends to demonhood is pleasing and original. I do care for the characters, but it never reached the same heights as the previous novel. And it felt like instead of expanding upon the Legion it, and show us more and new interesting characters, it felt like it was narrowing down, shrinking it cutting away characters instead and limiting our knowledge of the current state of the Legion. But it did show different things, challenged the mind with, with some philosophical thinking and interesting dilemmas. It does have some power, powerful scenes and great characters and it actually took some from John Friend's ter terrible trilogy and made it good. It was just missing something there, it was just a little bit that it was missing. But it, I would heavily recommend that you read it. It is important both to the series as a whole, but then also for the Thousand Sons storyline. Next time we see Magnus, Iron Man and the rest, they will be at Terra, I would assume. I will give this novel 8 out of 10 forks, and with that I will conclude this book review. Thank you very much for watching this book review. See you around everybody, bye bye!